The Scaled Agile framework is popular in big organizations, but it's pretty much universally unpopular with the people that started the Agile movement and most other well-known Agile practitioners that I know of or follow anyway. So where's the disconnect? And if ultimately our goal is to build better software faster, does SAFE help us to do that? Or to put it another way, is SAFE really SAFE? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. Okay, so the safe is really safe idea is a bit of a sound bite, I admit. And as one of my friends said when I told him that I was gonna make this video, do we really want to be safe in the first place? Or should we be taking risks in order to be able to do great things? But what I mean here is does SAFE achieve what the people that adopt it really want from it? I have two sources of information to determine this really. One is anecdotal, so not really very trustworthy. And the other comes from experience reports, most of which I found on Scaled Agile websites, so not really all that trustworthy either. So my real answer to this question is I don't know. My experience and the experience of many people in my position, people who work to advise organizations on how to do a better job of software development, is that SAFE is mostly used as a kind of organizational band-aid in big organizations, a kind of agile washing approach to reframe their poorly functioning waterfall as something else. These companies see others around them outperforming them. They'd like to do better, but they assume that they're already doing reasonably well. And so whatever this agile stuff is really about, it's likely to be a small course correction rather than a radical overhaul. So what they tend to assume is that they'll perform a few minor tweaks and carry on much as before, but now with better results. From my perspective, this is a pretty big mistake. A complete misunderstanding of the kind of change that true agile development represents. This approach results in the kind of flaccid, low-grade, ritualistic agile adoption that long-time agile practitioners like me despair of, and that for most people characterizes what agile development has become. An overly bureaucratic, ritualistic, formalized, hierarchical approach that doesn't really work to help to us to build better software faster at all. Before I go any further, let me thank our sponsors. We're fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis, Transfic, Sleuth, and IcePanel. All of these companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, do take a look at the links in the description below to check them out. The problem with agile adoption is that it represents a very challenging change in perspective. The kind of change that's difficult and challenging for organizations to make. I don't think that there is much doubt that an agile approach works better as long as we discount the fake institutional version of agile development that's all too common. But to get to the genuine version, it requires people to think very differently about software development in general. Let me give you one specific example. In preparing for this video, I did some research amongst other things. I looked at case studies on the Scaled Agile website. Scaled Agile is the organization that developed SAFE in the first place. In one of them, the people that were saying how great SAFE had been for them listed their primary goals, one of which was higher predictability. I think that this is one of those ideas that is, to me at least, sounds like a dog whistle for old style thinking. As a company, if you could have software sooner, let's say in half the time, or on the exact day that you predicted before you started, which would you prefer? Clearly, if you have the new feature in half the time, it's ready for the day that you hoped for anyway. So what we should optimize for is surely efficiency. So any extra work that we do to improve predictability is um, extra work. So it slows our productivity. Yes, Dave, I imagine you saying now, but we need predictability so that we can coordinate work with others. Well, 
The iterative engineering approach that I think underpins true agile thinking presents us with a variety of alternatives that work better than predictability to achieve this. Continuous integration allows us to verify that things work together as they are in the process of being built. Working to manage complexity in our designs allows us to make progress in one part of the software without it impacting on other parts. Using automated testing so, and so designing for testability improves the quality of our designs to help us further enhance the management of the complexity. Aut autonomous mission-focused teams, as described in the Team Topologies book, allow small teams to make progress independently of other teams and so on and so on. None of these things improve predictability in terms of when we will deliver what, but they all mean that we can build better software faster. They do this because working this way means that our software works all of the time. So we don't need to make predictions. We know that it works. That allows us to grow our software incrementally at a faster rate and with higher quality than any other approach that we know of so far. This is a big idea to grasp, and people thinking in terms of predictability aren't there yet. Is this the fault of SAFE though? Well, yes. SAFE defines flow predictability as one of the six metrics for flow. I don't care if the flow is predictable, as long as it's continuous. Actually, that's wrong. I don't want the flow to be predictable. Because if it's predictable, then it means that I'm not learning anything, and I'm not improving. I was talking to Prag Dave Thomas recently, and he makes a good point. Agile is a verb, not a noun. You're not doing agile. You're agile if you can change. So that should really be at odds with the notion of predictability. If I can change for the better, build software faster or better, or find new ideas that meet user needs better than the idea that I was focused on up until now, then that's me being unpredictable, but in a positive way. When I first saw SAFE, it reminded me a lot of the rational unified process from the 1990s. And I think that SAFE suffers from exactly the same problem. Reading SAFE from my perspective as an experienced agile developer, I can find lots of ideas that I like. When I was first introduced to RUP in the 1990s, I saw it from the perspective of someone who was already used to working in small, high-functioning, what we'd probably now call agile teams. So that is how I saw RUP. There was a lot of extraneous stuff there that presumably, I assumed at the time, may be useful in some corner case circumstances, but that I could ignore. RUP worked very well as long as we ignored most of it. The trouble is, is that if you read SAFE, or for that matter RUP, from a different mindset, more closely aligned with presumably their target audience, people who don't already know how to do this, they see things very differently indeed. In RUP's case, what nearly every organisation did in the late 90s and early 2000s was to implement all of it, every artefact, every process. These companies ended up with a massively bureaucratic waterfall process as a result, structured around RUPS tools and artifacts. I've seen the same kind of thing happen with SAFE. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about what I think really works, then take a look at my training course, Better Software Faster. It explores in some detail what continuous delivery is, how it works and why it works, and the advantages that you gain from practicing it. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to learn more about that. Now, back to SAFE. Here's a picture from the Scaled Agile website describing business agility. I don't like this as a diagram at all, but if I'm being generous, I could say that this is a list of things that do need to happen. But that's not what this diagram is really saying, is it? And I don't think it's how people coming at it from the mindset of someone more used to traditional sequential development approaches will read it. This looks like a sequence of steps, but in an agile organization, it is not. In fact, it must not be treated as a sequence of steps. In an agile organization, we sh assume that after each of these steps, there will be mistakes. 
So our job isn't to organize our work into a sequence like this, it's to proceed in a fine-grained iteration cycling around all of these ideas so that we can try and find where the mistakes are as quickly and as cheaply as we can. When we find a mistake, we can change things. That's what the agility in agile thinking really means. How do you sense an opportunity without connecting with a customer? Well, you may in some circumstances, I suppose, but certainly not in others. According to this diagram, we clearly need to fund an MVP and organize around value first and only learn and adapt once all of our work is done. Presumably, we'll benefit from the learning in the next project because all of our work's done in this one. Where's the iteration? Where's the adaption? Where's the agility in this diagram? In the truly agile teams that I've worked on, we did all of these things all of the time, iterating on all of them and changing course as we learned new things all of the time. So my first problem really with SAFE is that it is deeply open to interpretation. And to be honest, that's also one of its strengths, I suppose. And I think here we get into one of the other problems that lots of people dislike it for. The reason that SAFE is popular is because it's not too disturbing for old school traditional enterprises. They can read the SAFE materials and misinterpret them so that it is just that minor tweak to waterfall thinking that we mentioned earlier. And here is also, I suppose, one of the ideas at the heart of the criticism. Did the SAFE creators do this on purpose or accidentally? If the goal is to reach people who think differently and to help them to start to change how they think, it doesn't really help to be dogmatic about terminology and ideas too much. We need to help them to start down the path towards a different style of thinking, a more enlightened viewpoint perhaps. So a generous interpretation of the motives behind SAFE is that it aims to help people bridge the gap between more traditional kind of PM style thinking and the thinking at the heart of agile development. The more negative interpretation is that if we make this look easy to traditional thinkers, we can sell more courses. How much is SAFE aimed at helping people take those first steps down the path versus selling some form of agile snake oil? Is this shitty agile for enterprises or is it agile training wheels? Let's be clear, if you do everything that SAFE describes, you still aren't going to be very agile. You might be better than you were before, but not really agile. But certainly, one of the themes that seems to emerge from the case studies on the Scaled Agile website is that SAFE does seem to have helped some of these companies, as you'd expect, their case studies advertising the process. And it helps them specifically in the area of increasing collaboration in development. This, like lots of other ideas in SAFE, is a very good thing. And it will improve development. But it takes more than only that, and it depends on what you mean by improving collaboration. If improved collaboration means that you have planning meeting every month instead of every six, that's better but not good. If it means a developer can go to someone more customer focused now and suggest a completely new approach, maybe even a new product idea, or that the team could prioritize clearing up some technical debt before they start on some new feature without asking for permission from someone outside of the team, then I'd say that these were signs of genuine agility. And effective collaboration and more distributed decision making in the right places that are the hallmarks really of agile development at scale. This is a diagram of the current full safe process. And of course, there's lots more detail behind this. This is part of the problem that I think that many agile practitioners have with it. It makes it all look so complex. Zoom in on any part and you can kind of think, well, okay, it's not always like that, but it sometimes is. So once again, Rather like the rational unified process, we have a kind of a la carte menu of agile practices here, but that are described in a way that means that they are too easily interpreted as saying, you must do all of these things to be agile. But where's the feedback? Where's the adaptability? How does this make decision-making agile? 
That is, how does this help us to change our minds and change direction? Where is that most agile of ideas that we can and probably will make mistakes everywhere in this picture? And so need to organize ourselves to allow us to identify them quickly and recover from them easily and safely. I don't think that you get to agility from here. And none of the case studies that I watched and I confess I didn't watch them all, indicated that the companies were now agile. There were some nice things, some improvements that SAFE had certainly helped with. The Porsche executive explaining excitedly how some of his dev teams uh, now worked so that their code was always working. Great, if SAFE helped them to get there, that's a very good thing indeed. But how do you navigate this process to achieve that significant win? That doesn't seem clear to me. Do we need to do all of these things or just all of the essential things? If we choose to do this without Scrum, but can still release on demand, have we failed at SAFE? Are we not yet agile? The way that I teach the adoption of continuous delivery is very different. It is to simply say that maintaining our software in a permanent releasable state is the goal. How you achieve that is contextual. It may be easy or it may be difficult depending on your software and your situation. But that is, clear, but that is the clearly defined target. You aren't practicing continuous delivery if you can't maintain your software in a releasable state. I may offer some help and suggestions of different techniques or practices that may help you to achieve that in your context, but there's no single recipe. However you choose to achieve it, if you can do this, you are practicing continuous delivery, and if you can't, you are not. For example, I doubt that you can do this successfully via a safe release train. But if you can do it that way, then I'm wrong and you're still practicing continuous delivery, whatever I think. I think that this is a very different kind of approach and a significantly more agile one. Instead of defining a specific solution, which I think is what SAFE is trying to do here, in continuous delivery, we define the fitness function, the goals that you, are, that you should be aiming to iterate towards. After each small change, are you now closer or further from your goal of maintaining your software in a permanently releasable state? That tells you whether the change is a good one or not, and nothing else can. I also think that this is a much better way to begin, and a more likely route to genuine agile ad adoption in an organization, even maybe especially in large organizations. We set ourselves targets, goals, to help people to work towards hitting those goals, doing whatever it takes to achieve them. This is what agility really means. At its root, it's about inspect and adapt. Try something out, see if it works. If it doesn't, try something else. And if it does, build on what works with your next step. This is how science works. This is how engineering works. This is how software development works. And this is how successful businesses work too. There is lots of good advice in the depths of the safe materials. Nearly everywhere I look, I can agree that this is reasonable advice, but it comes across as a dogmatic, complex approach. And agile development may be hard to adopt, but it isn't a complex idea. To me, safe depicts a limited number of ways to achieve goals that matter. There are more and often better ways to achieve those same goals. It describes activities without really clearly defining what those goals are though. It says lots of things that I'd agree with, but it also prescribes approaches that I've never seen work. For me, the heart of real agility is the ability of the people and the organization to change direction. It gives us that freedom to explore ideas and yes, to even make mistakes, but to do it in a safe and controlled manner. The result of all of that is that we do get to deliver better software faster. And I'm not sure that SAFE really helps us to do that in the end.
Thank you very much for uh, watching. Uh, and if you enjoy the stuff on, on this channel, please do consider supporting our work through by joining our Patreon community. There's lots of interesting discussion and, uh, and a growing community of people uh, on our Discord server. Thank you very much and bye-bye.